So we had this descending sequence of ordinals that we were, we were using, we were looking at that was crucial to understanding the chain for expanding a certain f. Um, and this was this is specifically f sub omega to the omega. Um, and so we're really just looking at how long that chain is. Um, and remember, the chain is determined by how many predecessor steps you need to take. Any place where like omega squared 2 turned into omega squared plus omega 2 plus 2 in a sequence one after the other of um, unpacking a limit ordinals, we're pretty much ignoring those steps. Uh, and that's okay right now because that doesn't actually, none of those lead to actually new insertions of functions in the sequence uh, for the expansion. So in terms of uh, analyzing the G, the number of functions, those don't really matter. Um, they do matter, and we'll talk about them in terms of how big the, the F result actually ends up being. Um, so what we got is 3 to the 3. That's very interesting. So N was 3, and look at that omega to the omega, and we know that a lot of this process is about taking omegas and turning them into Ns, and we've, if we've turned it into, um, as it happens, N to the N. So this is very suggestive of what the general rule might be. And in fact, there's a very cute trick here, which is um, that we just are going to take, if we have like G of, I claim like omega, uh, oops, there we go, G of omega to the omega to the omega, maybe uh, plus omega to the omega two, plus omega, then turns out what you do is you just take every single instance of omega and turn it into n. Oh, and then so this is of n. And this is going to be n to the n to the n, uh, plus n to the, we could say n2, but it looks weird. So n to the 2n plus n. Of course, it, ma it totally matters. Omega 2 is definitely different from 2 times omega. Uh, with ordinal arithmetic, but with ordinary arithmetic, we're going to put the numbers first. Okay, so the cute trick is simply to take um, any time omega shows up in the ordinal here, uh, you just replace it with n, and you actually get exactly the value of g. And we'll come back to that and and talk about a proof of that. Um, but just doing a few examples, uh, and the, notice it works for all the examples so far, um, will convince you that that's really kind of the pattern here. Um, one thing I want to mention just briefly is that it's reminiscent of uh, the Goodstein sequence story. And that's not at all um, accidental. The Goodstein sequence was about um, like iterated or generalized um, base n representation of a number. And if you look at this sequence, and in fact, not only do you, if you put in, this all came from omega to the omega, okay, and now that, what we're seeing is we want to think of that as kind of just turning into n to the n. If you actually, and specifically 3 to the 3 here, if you actually try and change all of these omegas to 3, what you see is that you're actually just looking at exactly all the numbers in descending sequence from 3 to the 3 downward um, written in, oh, hereditary, that's right. Yeah, there's various different, I think I, I used hereditary as the terminology. There's different, people use different words. Um, if you just look at 27, 3 to the 3, expressed in hereditary base 3, which is just 3 to the 3, and then you just take one away from that, one away from that, one away from that, it turns out that all the ways that you express that in hereditary base 3 notation are exactly these guys. It's really just ternary uh, notation because we haven't really done, done iterated exponents here yet. Okay, And in fact, 3 to the 3 is one thing that isn't hereditary base 3 notation. That would should really be 3 to the um, 3 to the 1, actually if you really wanted to write it as hereditary. And that's kind of corresponding to the fact that this isn't really part of the chain. This was where, where it came from. But the first thing we actually got as an expansion was actually the number 26 written out in base 3. Okay, So it turns out that just like with the Goodstein sequence story, um, we're writing 
you know, we write basically um, uh, our ordinal in hereditary, it's really our ordinal minus one actually is the starting one. So this is alpha, I guess I could say alpha minus one instead of our ordinal. We write alpha minus one in hereditary base n notation and all its predecessors. That's just an ordinary finite number, and we're just decrementing by one, by one, by one, by one, by one in um, that notation as well. Okay, but where omega is a placeholder for whatever n you, you are interested in at the time. Okay, so the punchline for us is pretty simple. It's simply that if you have any kind of expression involving omegas and, or, and um, ordinal arithmetic, just turn all your omegas into n's, and you get a very clean formula for how many distinct different functions you're going to get when you expand out f, and we've been calling that g. Okay, so I want to I want to go back to um, even though we have a nice rule up through this is going to take us up through one, one, uh, sorry epsilon naught basically. Um, I want to look at some of the fundamental ideas that have to do with g because there's actually a really really elegant way to describe how g behaves that in principle can take us for uh, describe g values for really really huge ordinals and that's what we're going to be interested in doing okay so what are the fundamental rules okay suppose i know g of alpha for some alpha and then i want to just say well what's g of the next one the successor ordinal well like for example um, one place where we did that was we knew that g sub omega of n was just n that was the first place we got an actual n dependence and then of course when we looked at omega plus one what happened when we go back to f what's the rule for the fast growing hierarchy our, our favorite friend um, f omega plus one is just immediately expanded in terms of the previous one and that gave us more one other kind of function as a leftover in addition to all these ones that we would have gotten from expanding f omega we got f omega itself okay and so voila is just exactly that number plus one and that's always going to happen successors for f behave in a very simple way and it just adds one thing to the chain. Okay, so let's go back down here. So very, very simple. The rule is it's just g of alpha plus one. Okay, oh, of n, sorry, there we go. Okay, so successors behave in the simplest way. g of a successor is just the ordinary successor, like as in just add one to this finite number of the number g of alpha of n. Okay, now what about when alpha is a limit? Well, if anything, that's maybe even simpler. It's just our absolute universal thing. So for example, let's go back up to our simplest example here again. Okay, what was g k of n? It was k, and then the way limits always work uh, for what we're always doing, it's almost a universal thing in everything I've talked about, is if this is a limit ordinal, you just replace it with the appropriate member of its fundamental sequence. And it's as if that's what that's the problem you actually posed. No, there's no manipulation. There's no calculation. No algebra. It's just a substitution. So that limit ordinal just becomes it's the appropriate member of its fundamental sequence. That works for f, but of course it's going to work for g as well because g is just describing one aspect of f, and so it's just going to be g of um, the nth number in the fundamental sequence applied to n. Okay. So if you look at it, these rules, oh, and of course we need a base for the uh, recursion, g of zero of n is zero. These three rules completely define a function g uh, that takes an ordinal and a finite number and produces another finite number. And it's really, really similar to the rules for the fast growing hierarchy. Let me remind you of the corresponding rules for the fire at fast growing hierarchy f of 0 of n, we usually use a subscript, but I'll just try to make them look exactly the same. That was n plus 1, successor. f of alpha plus 1 of n, that's, this is where the power comes in. It was the previous function repeated, ooh, sorry, I said I was going to be consistent. The previous function repeated a value of n, and that's where it's much more powerful. Um, and then the, the last rule is just verbatim the same except with the letter F and the letter G changed, um, and that's F of alpha. So you can see that really um, G can be thought of as its own th thing, 
that's just very analogous to f except that um, you lose exactly what made it so fast growing. But you still have the same idea that there's a simple successor rule and the limit rule is our pretty much universal limit rule for how to deal with a limit ordinal in the in the ordinal slot. Well, it turns out this has a name. Um, so G is in fact the slow growing hierarchy. These functions G form a hierarchy of functions just like F, uh, the, uh, the F functions do, and they're called the slow growing hierarchy. And they're completely defined by this rule. So usually you see it uh, simply as it's a different thing. It's analogous to the fast growing hierarchy. And here's the rules and here let's, let's analyze it. But I kind of like the fact that even if you're interested primarily in the fast growing hierarchy, uh, you get led to analyzing G um, by just saying, well, what's, what's one way to make a little bit of sense to have some sort of really weak shadow of what's going on with F? Um, and if you just ask this question of how many distinct functions there are in the, the, the initial expansion of F, you actually reinvent the, the slow growing hierarchy, which happened to me because I was thinking, um, I had heard of the slow growing hierarchy, but I didn't think it was interesting. And then I started asking this question about expanding Fs and I realized eventually, later than I thought I, sh I should have, like, oh, hey, that's the slow growing hierarchy. What an interesting fact, okay. Um, so we've got some values so far. Uh, GK of N is K and notice, um, this is really wimpy. It, it's a constant function. This is definitely, if you think slow growing function, constant really fits that, that description. It's really slow growing. As a function of n, it doesn't grow at all. And so it's only when you get to the first limit ordinal that g actually has any growth rate at all. Here it's linear. g omega plus 1 of n is n plus 1, still linear. So till still linear okay but a little bit bigger g omega to the omega was an example that i did let me just put in one extra based on our rule again a, a really good exercise oh I'm, and i'm back to using subscripts sorry I, i'll go back and forth these subscripts aren't ridiculously small um this is and just n squared and that's quadratic and then this is exponential tiny bit, bit bigger than like a constant to n, like 2 to the n or e to the n or 10 to the n, but not really that qualitatively different, essentially exponential growth. Okay, so um, some some key examples of what g looks like, um, and I'm trying to delete that extra space, but it sometimes doesn't let me. Um, there we go. So we want to continue this story, and the main thing we're interested in, again, is not so much G as its own object, but how it sort of gives us an idea of the strength of F. So let me look at these examples, and it's what we've seen so far, and talk about how they're similar and how they're different. Um, and that'll probably be good enough for this video. First of all, it is a weak, 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 weak shadow of F itself. You do, you really, it gets the name slow growing hierarchy for a good reason. Um, G is not a way to create, an efficient way to create ridiculously huge numbers. Um, it is a very weak shadow of F. Um, in particular, for example, if I increase G, if I look at two G values, G, G functions, and I notice, like these two examples, that one of them is simply one plus the other. The growth rate hasn't increased. It's just like here, this is a straight line, 45 degree line if you graph it. This is just up one a little bit, but it's not really growing any faster, okay? But nonetheless, if I increase g by one, you know, what happens to f? Um, I've talked before about g omega, or f omega is a very nicely fast growing function because it, it essentially um, puts the variable in the number of up arrows slot in the Knuth up arrow notation. Um, and that's n no mean feat. But if you if you do it for like two or three, it doesn't produce ridiculously huge numbers. But you put you look at f omega plus one. Um, you're just increasing that ordinal by one. Remember f omega plus one. And the cursor's in the way. Of say three, that's f omega of f uh, omega of hello. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. There we go. Oh, and the subscript was going wrong. Okay, there we go. 
of 3. Okay, so you get this thing, which is a medium-sized number. That's f3 of 3. It's pretty decently big, but, but not by our standards. But then you put that into f omega, and that's where it gets huge, because now the f3 of 3 gets duplicated in that slot, and then that whole thing gets duplicated in that slot. And we've seen how that combination of alternation of uh, diagonalization and the recursive iteration procedure that f is defined with, that is what creates ginormous numbers. And so g doesn't record that explicitly, but it just says, oh, the number of things in the expansion went up by one. So really what we want to remember is that when, it, when, when you have two g functions and you notice, oh gosh, they're super, super similar, one is just one plus the last one, that's still a really big jump in the numbers that you get out of the, the corresponding f's. So for example, um, g sub omega squared plus one of n, that's just n squared plus one, that is, it's not a different from quadratic, it's just sort of shifted up if you look at the graph of that function, but it's going to produce significantly bigger numbers. Okay. Um, now, what about if you look at situations where g increases qualitatively from constant to linear, from linear to quadratic, from quadratic to exponential? Um, well, that is indicating a huge increase in the f, um, the f alpha of n values. Okay. That's going, for example, from the constant. The constants are uh, on the order of, you know, n triple up n, or n uh, five up a up, five up ups, boy, five ups n, decently big by pedestrian standards, but not taking advantage of the real power of the fast growing hierarchy. And then when you get to linear growth, uh, like f omega, f omega plus one, that is much, much bigger. That gets to the basic Conway chained arrow story. If you then go to quadratic, turns out that, I think, I've, uh, yeah, I talked about this, that where the, when you get to quadratic, g omega squared is um, the f, for example, f sub omega squared of n, let me remind you, this is approximately uh, like n to n to n to n, and you have n of these arrows, okay? That's a lot, lot, lot bigger than just either a small number of Conway chained arrows or certainly a small number or, you know, any kind of decently finite number of Knuth up arrows. And that's just going from linear to quadratic. Quadratic is the simple, it's kind of the most mild kind of nonlinear growth a function can almost have, and yet it's a shadow of incredibly strong growth for f. Then if you add one, it's like doing this, pro we've seen this before, do this process, but then use that as the number of chained arrows in another calculation, and then do that n times. And then n to the n, that's where we're getting to the G, uh, f omega to the omega level, where what we see is that you've got a huge number of things even in the expansion, and that's going to create an absolutely incredible number. Okay, so there's a lot of difference here. It is a super weak shadow, but the nice thing is there's a systematic correlation. It's not a horrible proxy um, for uh, for f in, in that there's a there's this uh, this correlation that when this goes up by a tiny bit, f will grow up grow significantly. When this grows uh, qualitatively, f will grow tremendously. And so it's not a horrible thing to look at this and um, use that instead of trying to directly attack an understanding of f, which can be really, really difficult. Okay, we'll continue that story, and pretty soon we'll use this as a, a means for understanding um, much, much, much bigger f's than we've done before.